All right, First Timothy for beginners. This is lesson number 13 uh, in the series entitled Paul's Final Instructions to the Church and uh, Timothy. And we'll cover First Timothy chapter six, uh, verses three to 21. So in our last uh, lesson, we reviewed some of the features of slavery in both the Old Testament and New Testament uh, in those historical periods. Some basic ideas from that lesson I'd like to review before we move on. First of all, slavery existed uh, among both pagan and Jews, uh, uh, Jewish populations in the Old Testament, and in the Roman Empire among Christians in the New Testament. So there's the existence of slavery in the Jewish community in the Old Testament, New Testament Christian community as well. The main difference between pagans and believers in those times was that slaves uh, among pagans were only property, considered only as property. And among believers uh, had a, a certain amount of protection um, by religious law and principles and uh, were also included in the practice of the faith. So slaves in the Old Testament were included in the worship to uh, God uh, as in the New Testament, those who were you know, slaves, many of them became Christians, participated in the faith, participated in church life along with their masters. Uh, we shouldn't compare the slavery of New Testament times, for example, which was mostly uh, domestic and uh, laborers, to the slavery of the 18th and 19th century um, uh, American uh, history. Um, Jesus and the apostles uh, commented on slavery, but they did not condemn or rebel against it for a variety of reasons. Um, one of which was the fact that as a system, as a social system, it was passing away. And uh, there was nothing to replace it in society at that time. And also the message of the gospel is to reconcile man to God through Christ and not champion a variety of social causes, poverty and slavery and so on and so forth. The preaching of the message and the acceptance of the message ultimately begins to uh, address those, um, those, social, uh, those social ills. Uh, as Christianity grew and spread, its impact would be seen in the fading away of slavery, as I mentioned, also the elimination of polygamy, which was very common in the first century, and a greater respect for the poor, for women, for children, for the weak, for elderly, for the sick, those groups that were traditionally marginalized, oppressed, Christianity spoke to these and helped elevate these groups uh, to a better position within society. And so the yeast of the Christian faith is seen in social change over the decades and over the centuries. Moral evil of every kind is eventually reduced, in some cases eliminated, because it isn't acceptable with the Christian faith and, and lifestyle. I, I give my famous example, I like to use the example of smoking because I was a smoker uh, and I understand the habit, I understand the problems of, of, of quitting, let's put it that way. And I mentioned to you before, I, I started to smoke when I was like, I was 12 years old, I started to smoke, and I smoked until I was 30. And I tried a lot of times to quit, and I heard every argument against smoking, bad for your health, bad for the environment, secondhand smoke, none of those arguments ever uh, was strong enough to get me to quit, uh, to quit smoking. Uh, it's only when I became a Christian uh, did I finally quit successfully because smoking was not compatible with my faith. It, as a habit, it was not compatible with my goals and certainly with the spirit of God that was, uh, that was within me. Um, and so, uh, you know, Christianity, if you wish, the faith that I had in Christ, it was the thing that motivated me to quit and quit successfully. All right, so this week we're going to go back over these verses in chapter six and we're going to see what Paul is actually saying about uh, the social ill, the social sinfulness of slavery. And he begins with instructions to Christian slaves. So let's go to chapter six, beginning in verse one. He says, 
All who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. So note here that Paul gives no instructions to masters, only to slaves. He gives instructions to masters in two other epistles, Ephesians chapter six and Colossians chapter four, verse one. In those two epistles, he, he directs his comments to, uh, to uh, Christians uh, who own slaves, the, the, the masters. Uh, he says two things to Christians at Ephesus uh, who are slaves. Uh, first of all, he says, uh, uh, honor or respect their pagan masters as a witness of their faith. Slaves uh, couldn't preach or teach their masters to their masters. They didn't have the position to go in and say, let me teach you, let me tell you something. You know, they didn't have that, that opportunity. And so the way that they acted and the way that they respected their masters would serve as their witness or conversely, as their condemnation of their own faith. In other words, the judgment of the master about their faith would rest upon their attitude and their actions. Even though they couldn't speak, even though they couldn't teach, they didn't have that opportunity with their masters, their actions did the speaking. Their actions and their attitude did the teaching. Uh, second thing that he mentions, don't take advantage of the fact that uh, your master is a fellow believer. You know, to disrespect or to give less service because he is your equal in Christ. So he's, you know, he's addressing slaves who are, uh, you know, who have uh, pagans as masters and now uh, slaves who have Christians as masters. As Christians in different positions, both master and slave are interested in doing well. You know, partaking of the benefit, the benefit of the gospel. And so uh, they, they, they want to do well to one another. Treat each other, if you wish, in a proper way. The slave to render good service and the master in being fair and generous to his slave. Uh, both sharing in the benefits that come from being Christians. For example, good service and fair treatment. Uh, the master benefits from the Christianity of his slave in that the slave gives him honest, sincere, uh, good service. And the slave benefits from his master being a believer in that the master is fair with him and generous and kind to him. So these principles about the master-slave relationship should be the basis for teaching on this subject in all churches where Timothy teaches or the subject is taught. Remember, Paul is teaching Timothy the things that he needs to be focusing on in his own teaching to the church where he serves and, and other places where he, where he goes. And so this is his teaching as far as the master-slave relationship is concerned. Because in those churches, they had many, many Christians who were uh, slaves uh, in both situations. Slaves uh, owned by uh, those who were not Christians and slaves owned by those who were believers. So there needed to be some instruction on how each party should be uh, acting. Now, in this last section, chapters uh, six three to 21, Paul is going to give general instructions for those who minister in the church and specific instructions to Timothy himself for his own ministry. So first, we begin with a warning to those who cause division in, um, in verses uh, three uh, to five. Let's read that. He says, if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, 
who suppose that godliness is a means of, uh, is a means of gain. So uh, Paul returns to one of his original points in chapter one concerning false teachers who cause trouble in the, in the church. It seems that some are profiting financially from their false teaching. And Paul suggests that this may be the true motive behind their teaching in the first place. He describes their method of operation. First, they oppose the teaching established by Jesus and the apostles and promoted by Timothy concerning the way of godliness. In other words, how to be like God, how to be Christ-like, how to live righteously. They oppose the way that Timothy uh, is teaching how to achieve these ends. And he says, they substitute the teaching of Christ with debates over words and obscure doctrines, uh, over controversial issues which give rise to arguments and division and evil thoughts and suspicions about one another. Paul also reveals the true nature and goal of these troublemakers. He says they pose as teachers, but they don't really know anything. And when he says know anything, they don't know, any, they don't know anything about the gospel. They don't know anything about God. He says they pretend to know more than the true teachers by their empty knowledge and their conceit. And their minds, he says, are corrupt. And this corruption is proven by what they produce. You, know, you can tell a tree by its fruit. You can tell a teacher by the fruit that he, produ he produces with his teaching. So it's not that godliness is a way to make money. It's that the true motivation for these teachers is the desire to make money from their teaching. Uh, and not just from their teaching, what makes it all the worse is from their false teaching about spiritual things such as godliness. How do we become like God? How do we become uh, acceptable in God's uh, sight? The things that they were teaching had no bearing on that, didn't produce that. He's saying they, it produced exactly the opposite, division and, and, and trouble and friction and pride. So Paul mentions the idea of money also as a way to lead into his next point, and that is to warn uh, those who, whose great desire is money, the danger of the desire always of money. So we read in verse uh, six, he says, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, uh, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So he picks up the idea of, of uh, godliness and gain, meaning wealth, and he says that Unlike the perverted teachings of the troublemakers, there's a relationship between godliness and gain. And he says true godliness, when it is accompanied by contentment, is a great way to gain or to prosper. What a wonderful thing if in this world we, we move forward, we're successful, and we're also reaching our spiritual goals, you know, being uh, acceptable before God, and in addition to that, we are content. You know, godliness with contentment, there's great gain for you. There's something that's valuable. There's something worth pursuing. So the idea is that when someone is right with God, godly, he can be content with the basics, food and covering. See what I'm saying? Conversely, if you're not right with God, then it doesn't matter what you have. You're never content. The message between the lines is that it's godliness that creates contentment in the heart, not wealth. We have nothing when we're born and we bring nothing in death. And whatever we accumulate in between does not have the power to give us the kind of peace and contentment provided by godliness. 
So he finishes with a warning against the love or the desire for money. It's the root, he says, or the basis for many other evils in life. This desire drives us to say and do many foolish and dangerous and sinful things, the love or the desire of money. Uh, we often hear this quote misquoted, right? You know, my, I've heard people say, oh, money is the root of all evil. Well, no, money is not the root of all evil. Paul is saying the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay, that's correct. Money is amoral. It's neither good nor bad. It's simply a tool. It's simply a, something we use to get other things. It's a commodity. But when this is the object of our desire, however, uh, that's when we get, that's when we get in, in trouble. And so uh, the worst of these, he says, is that the pursuit of money draws us away from the pursuit of holiness and godliness and love and replaces these with the pursuit of personal wealth and security and power over others and the collection of things and pleasure. So the end result, of course, is that we exchange our soul for a share of the wealth of this world. You know, doesn't Jesus warn, what are you going to give in exchange for your soul? So in verses 17 to 19, he uh, continues his thought. He says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things uh, to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. And so we skip to this part because it's the natural point that follows the warning against the overwhelming love of money. I'll get back to the, you know, the passage in between here, but this, is, this goes with the, the section on the, you know, the, the desire for money. Usually the poor think and dream and pursue wealth to their own destruction at times. However, gaining or having wealth is not a sin in itself. It's simply a challenge to one's spirituality if it is abused. So Paul has an exhortation for those who already have wealth so that their wealth will not become a cause for sin. He says, A, make sure that your faith is in God, not in the wealth that you have. Make sure that you know, your security is the fact that, that, that you believe in God and that you trust Him to care for you, not, and not in your bank account. Now when you're poor, that's kind of, it's a little easier to do, right? But when you're rich, that's kind of difficult to do because you see this big bank account and you own three houses and you got all kinds of, your investments are doing well and your house is paid off and you know, you know it's, it's easy to kind of trust that and relegate to the back burner your relationship with God. Another thing he says, don't let your wealth make you conceited. You know, I'm better than you are because I'm rich or I don't need anyone. One of the big motivating factors for people to chase after wealth is they think that once they have wealth, enough wealth, they don't need anyone else. They have, quote, freedom. And of course, that's not so. I mean, we serve God or we serve Satan. There's only two people we, we serve. We serve God knowingly or we serve Satan unknowingly or knowingly. Don't think that you know, your wealth is you know, what makes you great. Another thing he says, realize that God is the one who provides the wealth, not yourself, so be thankful. Be thankful. Some people feel guilty about their wealth. They feel guilty about what they have. Oh man, I don't deserve this. And, oh, it's not much. You know, they're always downplaying stuff. You know, there's this kind of a little bit of shame or guilt because they have so much and others don't have as much. And Paul, you know, he gives us the antidote to this feeling of, of guilt or you know, shame because we have, we have a lot, we've been blessed with a lot. 
Gratitude, give thanks. You're giving of thanks to God for what you have is what blesses what you have so that you can use it without feeling guilty. Another thing he talks about, remember that wealth is uncertain, but God is always there. How many times have we read in the paper about the big crash in 29, then another crash in 89, another crash in two, you know. People have millions and millions and millions of dollars, everything seems fine, and then in a day the market switches or whatever. It all disappears. Wealth is uncertain, but God, God is always there. He also says, use your wealth in God's service, not your own, so that you become wealthy before God. Remember I said some people they feel a little guilty, a little ashamed because they've got so much and others have so little. Yeah, be thankful. That's the first step. Recognize who has provided you with all of this. And the second step is here. Use your wealth to serve God. How can I serve you, Lord, with what I have, with what you've given me? That doesn't mean you, you give it all away. You can enjoy the good life that God has provided through what you have. But satisfaction, you know, the, the satisfaction from your wealth, uh, that only comes as you begin to use part of it in helping others, supporting the church, whatever. And then he says, pursue true life, which is spiritual life, rather than the life that money buys. And let's face it, money buys a nice life, you know. Absolutely, and there's nothing wrong with having a nice life. It's great, it's marvelous. God has provided it. I get up every day and say thank you, go to bed at night and say thank you again. But the life that brings me satisfaction and peace is not the life that, you know, that I can buy because I'm wealthy or prosperous. It's the life that I cultivate through my submission to the Holy Spirit in pursuing Godliness, that's what gives me satisfaction. So in the end, rich and poor alike will receive what they have yearned for, wealth and pleasure on earth, or eternal life with God in heaven. Depends what you're, what you're looking for. And then we move on, we go back to the, you know, the passage. Paul goes back and he gives a warning to ministers. The final word in the letter goes to Timothy, of course, and those like him whose task is to minister to the church. So we, you know, we go back now to the verse 11. You know, we skipped over just to talk about, you know, he talks about money here and then we skip over and he, he makes some conclusions about wealth. All right, and well now we go back to the passages that uh, we skipped and we read in verse 11. He says, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testifies the good confession before, excuse me, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. So his warning and encouragement are based on the previous things um, that he has written. First of all, avoid the division and strife of the false teachers and the pursuit of wealth for its own sake. He says, run away from these things. Don't, don't even get involved, don't, don't get into the fight, just run away from that, they produce nothing. And instead of doing this, instead of investing your energy in this, he says, focus on uh, spiritual goals. Focus your energy on spiritual goals like righteousness, right living. You have a certain amount of spiritual and emotional energy. Invest that in living in the right way. Invest that in the pursuit of godliness. In other words, a godly character and spirit. Invest that in faith being faithful to God, being faithful to His word, being faithful to His church. Invest, excuse me, invest that in love, the love of God and the love of others. 
Invest that in the perseverance. In other words, to abide under, persevere in your work. Interesting Greek word means to abide under. And uh, the image that I like to give to, to explain this word, you know, a Superman, you know, uh, we've all looked at the, seen the Superman costume, the, the movies, the comic books, you know, when I was a kid, very popular. And, and there's a, usually one scene, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, there's a train, you know, and the train's crossing a bridge, you know, a track over a bridge, whoop, and a section of the track is, has, has you know, fallen down and there's a gap there and the train's on its way with all the passengers and everything. So Superman, you know, he flies in underneath, the, no time to repair it. So he, he grabs one you know, side of the track and the other side and you know, he stands like this and, you know, and the train just goes over him. You know, he's Superman. That's the image of abiding under. That's the imagery of this word perseverance. You know, uh, uh, to, to, to allow things, you know, to support things. The load that the Christian supports is the work and the challenge of ministry. Lots of things happen in ministry that you can't change, that you, you, know, you, you may have no power to, 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 to deal with. Sometimes you just have to bear it, to bear under, to persevere, let the, let the load, you know, go right over you. So focus your energy on that. And also he says, uh, gentleness, meekness, uh, the opposite of self-interest or self-promotion. These, the, these are the type of things to focus your, your energy on. He tells him, fight your own battle of faith. You know, he's a minister, but he is also an individual Christian who needs to remain faithful until the end in order to be with Christ in eternity. Timothy is. Yeah, he's a minister, he's serving in the church, but, he, but he's also an individual Christian. In the end, all of us must fight the good fight of faith. It's not any easier or different for ministers. They have their own particular challenges. In the end, all of us must fight the good fight. And like everyone else, uh, Timothy confessed Christ in becoming a Christian and he must now complete the race along with everyone else and especially him, because others are looking to him as an example. It's a terrible thing when a minister you know, does something wrong or evil and destroys his own ministry and destroys his uh, credibility with the congregation. It's, it's a terrible thing for him, of course, but it's a terrible thing for a congregation because many people themselves lose courage if they see the ones who are leading uh, they see them fall, they see them quit. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, you fight your own battle of faith, it's important. And of course, preach the word faithfully. Jesus made the good confession that he was the son of God, even when it caused his death. When the high priest finally, you know, they couldn't condemn him, they tried all kinds of charges and in exasperation, the high priest said, look, just tell us, are you the son of God or aren't you? <laughs> And Jesus said, yes, I am. Yeah, he, he could not lie about himself. So Timothy, as a preacher, must maintain this basic doctrine of the faith despite all obstacles. The job of preachers is not only to proclaim the gospel, whose central teaching is the divinity of Christ, they must also preserve the integrity of the message without changing or adding or deleting until they pass it on to the next generation or until Jesus returns. So we continue uh, reading verse 20. He says, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. Grace be uh, with you. And so uh, the balance of uh, Paul's uh, exhortation to Timothy uh, comes at the end of the letter. And what does he say? Uh, uh, guard your gifts, you know, avoid strife, focus on spiritual goals, fight your own personal battle of faith, preach the word faithfully, guard your gifts. Timothy has two gifts. One is the knowledge of the gospel itself received from Paul and the other is the ministry of preaching received from God through the laying on of the hands of the elders. In other words, the elders commissioned him or ordained him into the work 
of uh, the gospel. Read about that in 1 Timothy 4, verse 14. But these two gifts are both sides of the same coin that Timothy is to guard by not being drawn into the division and the debates that seem to be going on in that church. Also, he's not to trade the gospel for the false knowledge or the philosophy that was being promoted at the time. And some were making money at the time. And some were you know, drawing followers at the time. You know, Paul's saying, don't get sucked into that. You, you keep preaching the gospel. He was a young man and he could be seduced into joining the older and perhaps, quote, educated teachers who were promoting a false teaching with fancy words and claims of their superior knowledge. He could have been you know, dragged into that. Others had been seduced and led away, but he had to guard against this and remain faithful to his calling and to the message of the gospel. Paul then ends the letter with the blessing, grace be with you. And grace here includes all of the blessings of God summarized in a single word. You know, salvation, eternal life, the Holy Spirit, all the blessings, all the spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. You know, all of them would take pages to write. He squeezes them all down, one word, grace. And then in verses 15b and 16, a dexology, he says, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion, amen. So these verses are out of context with the message that Paul is giving to Timothy as far as warnings and encouragement. They're neither a warning, neither an encouragement. They're what we call a doxology or spontaneous praise. Paul becomes caught up in what he is saying to Timothy in his letter and he simply breaks out into praise before continuing on with the subject at hand. As he talks about the eventual coming of Jesus, he gets carried away and he says, God, who is the most blessed of all sovereigns, he's the king of all the kings, he's the Lord of all the lords, he is eternal, he is the source of light, is unapproachable by sinful man. He and only he, Paul says, is worthy of honor and worthy to rule over all things. Paul says it is this God who will reveal the Christ at the end of the world, a time that only he knows. So Paul praises Christ, his message, and also praises and worships the Father. And so the doxology correctly praises the Godhead, uh, the Father who sent Jesus to the cross and will reveal Him in the end, the Son who died for sin and whose resurrection will precede our own, and the Holy Spirit whose word Timothy must guard and proclaim until Christ returns. And that's the end of this uh, particular uh, book, 1 Timothy. The end of our series, I want to thank you for your, uh, for your attention. Thank those who are watching online as well. Encourage you to stay with us and uh, find the second book of Timothy as we uh, close out uh, the uh, uh, series on the pastoral epistles. First Timothy, second Timothy will be available soon and then Titus. And so those three will comprise of the pastoral epistles. All right, thank you very much, God bless you. <laughs>